the God of wrath, the God of mercy, the God who reaches down to unworthy people. Well, good morning again, beloved. It is great to be together worshiping the Lord uh, with our lives as long as, as well as how we sing and praise together. If I haven't met you yet, please come say hello to me. I'd love to meet you. I love being a pastor, not just a preacher, and so I'd love to engage and interact with you if I can. Uh, We're nearing the end of our journey through the Old Testament book of Micah, and so if you haven't been here, we're coming to the end. It's kind of sad that that next week will be the last sermon in this series, Uh, but that also means we're going to get a little more formal around here. Uh, If you know what that means from the past, I'd like for more than four of you to engage that with me if you would. Uh, But anyway... We're going to be in Micah 7 today, Micah 7, verses 11 through 17, so take your copy of God's Word, turn there with me, Micah 7, 11 through 17. Everyone loves a good rags to riches story, right? You know, like those movies where somebody down on their luck makes it in the big time and has a lot of success, things like Pursuit of Happiness or uh, Slumdog Millionaire. Maybe going a little older, Cinderella is kind of one of those, or my generation, Mr. Deeds actually was one. Anyway, um, also for you Hallmark movie fans, you might recall this one plot line where the small town waitress waits on the, the New York City lawyer whose car broke down after he took a wrong turn, and then uh, just later that evening happened to see her across the courtyard at the Christmas tree lighting, and, and then uh, he saw her at the family's bakery the next day, and then he ends up falling in love with her after cutting firewood with her dad, and then they <laughs> ends up buying the bed and breakfast that they end up making scones together for the rest of their It's so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I could get through it. Okay, no, really. Um, they're, they're good movies, because you already know the end, right? So you already know what's coming, which is actually the point of the sermon, by the way, but it's a whole nother. But... Seriously, though, there are also the real-life stories like Biddy Mason, known as Grandma Mason, who was born a slave in Mississippi but won her freedom in California in 1856, became one of Los Angeles' first black landowners, eventually amassing a fortune through real estate, generously giving away to the poor and helping finance the founding of the city's first black church. And so why do we love stories like that? These rags to riches, why do we love those? Because deep down, we all know that things are not the way they're supposed to be in the world right now. Like we want, we want a fix, we want restoration, we feel empty because creation is not as it once was back in Genesis 1 and 2, and creation is not the way it's going to be someday And so we want want to be restored. We see the evil and the wickedness in the world around us, and we want it to be gone. We also don't have that relationship with God like they had back in the garden, Adam and Eve, walking face to face with God. We don't have that anymore, and so we want restoration. We want our lives to be perfect again because they're not right now. And so what do we do with that? We... We tend to try to manipulate and control things to get them to be perfect for us, at least our perception. Or we turn to substances or to experiences to to try to fill the emptiness that we feel in our souls. Actually, what we're going to see today in Micah 7 is the culmination of everything we long for. It's, It's the end of everything we've been seen building throughout Micah, we've seen it now today come to this place where this is the restoration we see and long for. It's finally come. We'll see it. Look at Micah 7, verses 11 through 17. A day for the building of your walls. In that day, the boundaries shall be far extended. In that day, they will come to you from Assyria and the cities of Egypt, from Egypt to the river, from sea to sea, mountain to mountain. But the earth will be desolate because of its inhabitants for the fruit of their deeds. Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your inheritance, who dwell alone in a forest in the midst of a garden land. 
Let them graze in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old. As in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show them marvelous things. The nations shall see and be ashamed of all their might. They shall lay their hands on their mouths. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent, like the crawling things of the earth. They shall come from trembling out of their strongholds. They shall turn in dread to the Lord our God, and they shall be in fear of you. So he mentions at the, at the start here a couple of times this day he's talking about. Well, it's the same day he's been talking about throughout the book, that there's, there's a day coming when the Messiah King returns in victory. That's the day future for him, still future for us, when Jesus returns victoriously. So what he's talking about here is what will happen when that kingdom fully comes. He's looking future. He's telling us to look future. What's going to happen when God's kingdom fully comes? Now, again, as we've said throughout this series, there's an already but not yet nature to God's kingdom. Where, in a sense, since Jesus has come and done all that he's done, it, it already has come for those who have trusted in Jesus as their king and savior, have been brought into his kingdom. Yes, the kingdom has come, but it also has not yet fully come because God does not reign in every human heart yet. And we look around and we see things look like God doesn't rule and reign over them. They're, they're a mess. It's broken. And so we know the kingdom has not yet fully come, but one day, as we see here, one day it will. As verses 8 through 10 promised last week, the victory's coming. God will win. This is what it's looking forward to see what will happen when he does. What will happen when the kingdom fully comes. Here's what we see. First, we see God flips the script. God flips the script. It's actually what verse 11 indicates. First, it's that, remember, Assyria was the nation that was pressing in on Judah at this time. And so they're chewing up Judah's land as they're pressing into Jerusalem as the final prize. They're taking all of Judah's land. What once was Judah, once was Israel, they're taking it all. And all that's left is basically Jerusalem but one day, this says, that day, Judah's borders will be extended. Judah will actually grow. Judah will actually expand its boundaries because so many people are flowing into God's land. So that's one flip we see. Another flip we see in verse 13 is that where these nations like Babylon and Assyria, the ones that were oppressing God's people, Babylon and Assyria, they were crazy wealthy. They seemed successful. They would already be known as the most powerful nations on earth. They seemed like they had it all together, but they would be made desolate, it says. They will be made desolate. And that word desolation has been used throughout Micah, right, as a sign of judgment, that God would make those who opposed him a desolation, empty. But notice he says why. It would be because of its inhabitants, for the fruit of their deeds. Basically, it just means you reap what you sow. Sin has eternal effects. God will not just sweep it under the rug. There is a just God there. And so he's saying, no, I'm going to do something about that. And for those who turn away from God, even if they seem successful, even if they seem wealthy, all put together, everything is in order, even if they are that way, if they turn away from him, they will receive his judgment. They'll be made a desolation, he says. It's also what verses 16 and 17 allude to, where those who were once taunting Yahweh, remember last week, verse 10, you're like, where's the Lord your God? Like, our, we're coming in just mowing people down, no matter what their God is. He's like, where's the Lord your God? To come in taunting Yahweh, taunting Judah. Now it says they'll be made mute. These wealthy, powerful, strong taunting nations will be made mute and deaf. God will flip the script on them and make them instead a riches to rags story. 
that they thought they had it all together. They thought they were strong. They thought they were where they should be. And God makes them actually bite the dust like the serpent in Genesis 3. That's what it says here. Lick the dust like that where they're going to be trembling. They're going to be afraid. They're going to be put underneath his heel. They will finally see what they've been denying their entire lives, that there really is one true God out there. His name is Yahweh. Now, we can look at this from our side 2,700 years later, and we can say, well, that's, that's trouble for them. Of course, Assyria would be judged. Of course, Babylon would be judged. But, but let's not leave this in the Old Testament. Let's bring this to today and ask the question, where do you stand in all of this? Because God is still just. God still says he's going to judge sin. And so you have to ask the question, which direction is your script going to be flipped here? Because yes, for, for Judah, their script was going to be flipped and they were going to be expanded. They were going to have all the safety and protection and all those things that they needed. Yes, praise God for that flip of a script that what we are oppressed and downcast and cast away, like that's going to be made in, in all of God's ways righteous. Okay, great. But there's also the other way. It's what we see here. That you might think you have it all together. You might think that, that you are doing exactly what you, you, and listen, you can be in church your entire life and be this way. You're doing everything right. You got all the money you need. You, you got your family put together the way you want it. You've got your business put together the way you want it. Everything is exactly as you think it is. And everybody looks at you like you are the one that has the standard. But if you are turning away from God, if you have stiff-armed God and said, I don't want anything to do with you, even though I'm going to be a religious person because it's going to get me what I want, but in your heart, you've never said, Jesus, you are my Lord. You are my King and my Savior. He is going to judge you as well. If you stand in opposition to God, he will bring judgment in your life. He flips the script. When his kingdom comes, he exalts the humble, he humbles the exalted. It's what he does. But there is something interesting about this. Yes, he's going to judge the nations that turn away from him. He's going to judge the people that turn away from him. But he hasn't fully forgotten the nations, right? Now you see this here. He even draws the nations at the same time. He also draws. He's judging, but he's also drawing. Look at verse 12 again. In that day, again, this day that's coming forward, they will come to you. Micah's saying this to God. They will come to you from Assyria, the nations oppressing them, and the cities of Egypt, where they came from, and from Egypt to the river, from sea to sea, from mountain to mountain, basically from the entire earth, they will come. It's the same thing, if you remember, you've been tracking through this series with us, that God promised back in Micah chapter 4, where he was previewing the delivered city of Jerusalem up on this mountain again that was desolate. He says, no, it's actually going to be redone. Here's what's going to happen. It's going to look like this. And so look at chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. It shall come to pass in the latter days, again, day that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. It shall be lifted up above the hills and peoples, not just people like generic humans, peoples, that's nations, that's languages, that's people groups, shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his paths, his ways. We may walk in his paths. So this idea that God is going to, in the end, bring nations to himself, people to himself, is just the fulfillment of something he's promised for the whole book, the whole time. Even back to Genesis 12, when he chose Abraham, and he then chose Israel as well through Abraham, he says, I've blessed you to be a blessing to the nations. From the beginning of Israel's history, God said, I've blessed you to be a blessing to all the peoples of the earth. From the beginning, God had a greater plan for his people, for the whole world. 
That his blessing was not exclusive to one family, but it was actually for the nations. See, his choice of Abraham was an end in itself. Yes, that God chose Abraham, but it was also, at the same time, a means to an end. That Abraham's election was for mission. God chose Abraham for the purpose of blessing all the earth. And that's, that's part of the call he gave to Abraham. So that means for us, how does this work out for us as the church? That means the church should not see the mission of God as an add-on to its work. I think for so long, many Christians have seen, this is what we do. We come to church, we study the Bible, we sing, we do our Sunday school thing, and that's good. Just the mission is those people over there, those superhero Christians, keep it over there. Just don't get in our way, and we'll support you, but just this is, this is what we do, that's what you guys do. But actually, the mission is part of what God called Abraham to do. It's part of what he's called us into. It's what Isaiah heard from God. Isaiah 49, 6, God says to him, it's too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up just the tribes of Jacob and bring back the preserve of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. What he says to Isaiah is that it's not enough that he would get Israel back. It's great, yes, but it's not enough. He's after the nations too. It's all over Micah. It's all over the prophets. It's in Jesus' great commission mandate at the end of Matthew 28 to make disciples of all nations. At the end of Acts 1.8, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. This is from the very beginning. It's what God has had in mind for his people. To go to the nations, and it all culminates in this. It culminates in what the apostle John saw in the book of Revelation. So we're looking at this day, right, in, in Micah. We're looking at the day that Messiah returns. John got a glimpse of what it looks like on the other side of this thing. He said, I, here's what I see. Here's what I'm seeing happen in heaven right now, that it's going to be that way forever. John got a glimpse into that, where in Revelation 5, 9, and 10, he heard them sing this song to Jesus Worthy are you to take the scroll, to open its seals, for you were slain by your blood. You ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Continues chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. He looked again, and he saw this picture of the throne room of heaven. He said, I looked, and behold, a great multitude no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne to the Lamb. This is what heaven looks like. This is God's heart for the nations from the very beginning. He's always had that mindset. He's always been drawing people, including us, who are not ethnic Israel. He's, he's drawing nations to himself. And it culminates, as Micah looked forward, as John got to see, it culminates in a representative from every nation at the end. This is what God's heart shows us. It's not just about those people. It's about the nations. It's not just about us. It's about them as well. There's one more piece of Micah 7 that will happen when God fully inaugurates his kingdom. He will shepherd his people. So the last piece of this is that he will shepherd his people. God shepherds his people we see this in verse 14 of Micah 7. This is Micah praying to God. He says, shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your inheritance who dwell alone in a forest in the midst of a garden land. Let them graze in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old. Another flipping of the script here where Micah prayed that God would shepherd his people out of the ashes into the beauty because remember, 
In Micah's day, God's remnant of believers were in a really tough spot. Assyria was pressing in. They were surrounded out there by fertile ground, but they were living in scrub, basically. Because that word, you saw it there, who dwell alone in a forest, that word forest, don't think the hobbit, like lush green forestry, that's that's not it. It's actually more like West Texas scrub. Uh, That's the image we get from this word, which brings with it this idea of lonely, deprived, empty. There's nothing. That's why Micah intercedes here and prays, asking God to restore the lushness of the pastures of of these cities, Bashan and Gilead, which were right on the other side of the Jordan River. That was the entry into the promised land for God's people. So he's like, God, give us that back. We enjoyed that for many years right off the bat, how milk flowing, honey flowing. Like this was incredible. Look at the wheat and look at all this stuff that we could have. God, restore it again. We have scrub now. Restore us, God. But here's what that gives us a glimpse into. Part of God's judgment on his people, as his people turned away from him and turned to idols and all these other things, part of God's judgment was to turn the promised land into a wasteland. What they had was so beautiful and nice, and they said, all right, but we want this stuff over here, God, instead of you. And he just said, all right, here's what this is going to look like. Turned into a wasteland. Yet, God will one day reset that promise. He'll bring back beauty, bring back joy, and he'll do it, he says, through the image of a shepherd. Right? See that in verse 14, this image of a shepherd. It's been all throughout Micah. If you remember back to chapter 2, God said he's the king going out before his people and he's gathering them like a sheep in a fold. That he's the standard bearer in front of his people. And then in verse uh, 4 of chapter 5, that was the prophecy of the Messiah coming and he's going to be a shepherd standing and shepherding in the strength of the Lord, his flock. And we know both of those point to Jesus But what does this reveal about God, this idea of a shepherd? If that's how he's going to bring about this day, what does it reveal about him? What do we see God's heart here? Well, first we see that his heart is to provide for his flock. He turns the barren wasteland into a beautiful pasture land again. Takes beauty out of the ashes He provides for his people, but it also shows he covers his people with protection. That's the image of the staff. That God possesses this powerful authority to protect his people. So many people love Psalm 23, quoted at all kinds of things. But verse 4 says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That's how it's comforting is because I know, God, you can protect me with those things. As a sheep, the shepherd would lean on that shepherd's authority and ability to protect them from wolves and to keep them safe. Same thing. Shepherd your people with your staff, with protection. But then there's a third aspect. The shepherd portrays this intimacy with his people here. Did you see what Micah says in verse 14? He says, shepherd your people, God, the flock of your inheritance. There's there's an intimacy, there's a personal connection that he is longing to have restored again. Like they lost in the garden in Genesis 1 and 2. Adam had it. Genesis 3, they lost it. What he's now longing for is, God, give us your presence again. We want to be back with you again. We want to be your people again. Well, again, we're looking forward to a day when that becomes a reality, which John saw, Revelation 21, verse 3. He heard a loud voice saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them as their God. That's what he's longing for is this restoration of the relationship face-to-face with the holy God. That's what he wants. He longs that shepherd to be with them. 
And so as we come to this point, in spite of all the carnage and the mess we've seen throughout the book of Micah, right? Like just, it's been so hard to watch people turn away and turn away and be judged and brought back and turn away and this cycle of doom and judgment coming back over and over again. Yet, is this not a beautiful picture of what God is going to bring with him one day as the king returns to restore all things, where he makes his people the perfect rags to riches story? Is this not a glorious grace to us, church? That this is what God is bringing out of the mess that Micah was in, out of the mess that we live in, God is going to restore. And so what should we do now? What do we do now? Because no matter what Nostradamus says, this thing hasn't happened yet. Right? This is still coming. The full restoration, the full inauguration of the kingdom is still future. So what do we do until then? How do we respond to this? Knowing this is coming, what do we do now? First, trust God's plan. You've got to just trust God's plan in all of this. Because think, Micah never got to see the results of this, did he? Micah, in fact, got exiled here in just a few years after he writes this. He died, actually, before they got it. So he didn't get to see any of this. He never got to see that God would come through for his people. He never got to see that this restoration was going to happen, that God would flip the enemy on its head. So he had to trust. He had to have faith in his God, in this Lord of all the earth, that God, you're going to do this in your time and your way. It's what we see in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 over and over and over again, but specifically for those who died without seeing what God promised. Listen to Hebrews eleven thirteen. 13. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. See, that's how Micah could get there. That's how Micah could trust, is because he knew this was not his home. Even if it was perfect, even if everything was exactly as they would want it in Judah, it still wasn't home. He was longing for something more. And yet in that faith, he was able to see beyond, I mean, at least 2,700 years. We don't know when Jesus came back, but it's 2,700 years later than he was living. So he was able to see at least that far, and he's able to kind of greet it from afar and saying, God, all right, I, I, it feels like we're already there. I can see it. I can know it's real. I know you're going to do this, and so I can trust you, and I can almost live in it now. Greet it from afar. So his faith was in the promise of God. You and I must have that same faith, that same forward-thinking mentality. We must trust that the Lord is coming back one day, right? That this isn't it. <laughs> I hope this isn't it, right? We must trust that he is coming back. We must trust that even among those who are opposed to Yahweh today, that even some of those will come to believe. Remember Saul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, right? He, he was clearly opposed to all things Yahweh, and yet... God saved him. So God's going to do that with some. We must trust that the evil and wickedness we see around us every day, that God's going to do something about that, that he eventually will bring this to pass, that it won't be swept under the rug. We've got to trust that God's going to do it in his time and his way. We've got to trust that God's going to satisfy our souls as we deny ourselves of the things of the world and we turn to him. We've got to trust that that's going to be satisfying. We have to trust him. See, we can rewrite our, try to rewrite our own future. We can try to manipulate things to benefit ourselves, to make it the way we want it to, but we need to do what God is asking us to do right now and just trust him. 
Not try to control, manipulate, make it this way and fix this and do it this way. No, just trust him. His future plan, not our ideas on what that plan should be. Remember the bumper sticker, God is my co-pilot? No, God is your pilot. You sit in that seat. You sit in the back. Don't even sit up next to him. You sit in the back and just let him fly for you, right? If God's your co-pilot, that means you're flying the plane. You don't want that. You want his plan, his time, his way. Now, I know, listen, that's hard to do in the darkness. It's hard to see when you can't see. I get that. But that's why Micah is such a great example. Because it was as bad as it could ever get for for Micah and Judah. It was as bad as anything. It was way past anything we experience today. And yet, he still trusted. He still trusted, never wavered. You might never see God's promises come to pass in your lifetime. You might be asking and praying and longing for justice in this situation or that situation. You might never see it in your lifetime. But that doesn't mean that God's not on his throne. It doesn't mean that God's not good. He's just got a different timeline than you do. He's going to take care of the situation, so trust him. Let him do the task. Let him do his work. Let him do what he's going to do, what he's promised to do. Let him show himself strong. Have faith, trust. But even as you do that, it doesn't give you license to be lazy. That you have nothing to do. Well, I'm just trusting God, so I'm going to sit on the couch and play Xbox. Like, no, that's not what we're talking about. Because what did Micah do? What does verse 14 said he did? He interceded for others. He prayed. He went to the Lord and prayed. At minimum, whatever situation we're facing, we can pray. Because Micah has been standing by himself for the whole book. He's standing on God's side against everybody else. And he's like, it's like, God, I feel like I'm alone here. And, and I'm speaking your truth. Nothing is happening. Nothing is changing. God, why is this not working? And he could easily be tempted in that moment to look down on everybody else. Like, God, I'm seeking you. I'm trying to seek you. They're not even close. They're not even trying So I'm going to look down on them. That's not his attitude, is it? His attitude is to pray and have a heart broken for them. He longs for restoration for them. They don't deserve it. But he's saying, God, restore them. He loved them too much to let them go. He's done it through the whole book. God, don't let them go. Bring them back. My heart is still towards them, so God, restore them. I know it may feel like you have nothing you can do about the situation you're facing in your life. Everything's falling apart around you and you feel like I can't do anything about this. There's never nothing you can do about it. There's always something you can do about the situation. In fact, it's the most important thing you can do. It's why one of our values as a church is desperate dependence that we know we're trusting God to do the real work in this thing, right? Because only God can change a heart. Only God can fix a situation. Only God can restore a relationship. You can't do those things. You can't get in there and change it. It's got to be God's work. That's why we pray. That's why I send a letter to our widows and widowers every Monday saying, hey, pray for these things because I need them, you need them, we need them to carry these needs to God. We're not praying to get God to do something for us like a vending machine. Here's a dollar, give us this. We want God to do something that only he can take the credit for. And we need him to do the work that we can't do anything about. And so we lean on him, we need him. You can do that. You can intercede for yourself, of course, yes, but you can intercede for your family, for your spouse, for your coworker, for your neighbor, for your nation, for your your, your friends. You can intercede on behalf of them, praying for restoration in God's time, God's way. 
But then there's also this. When we talk about restoration, yes, we want that in our lives, but, but when was the last time you actually prayed for someone to be restored spiritually? When was the last time you prayed for an unbeliever to know Jesus? Remember a couple years ago, we did the who's your one thing. Are you praying that God would, which is the most important restoration, by the way, that God would restore someone spiritually, save them, reach into their sin and draw them out to righteousness. It's saving their soul from death. When was the last time you did that? Commit to praying for someone to know Jesus. Because, again, if this day hasn't come yet, we know God's not done drawing people to himself yet. There'll still be more that will come. Which leads to the last thing we should do now. In light of this future kingdom that's coming, we should proclaim the gospel. Proclaim the gospel. Proclaim this good news. Tell of God's salvation. You may recall Romans 10, 13. It says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But listen to verse 14 and then verse 15. How then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. What do we say every time we end a worship gathering here at Anderson Hills? You are sent. This is what you're sent to do. If you've ever wondered, yes, love people, all of those things, but, but this is what you're sent to do, right? To proclaim the gospel, to preach the good news that Jesus lived, died, and resurrected in our place. That is the best news. But here's the thing about good news. You know if there's good news, then there's comparatively bad news. And that's what we saw in Micah 7, right? That sin causes desolation, that brings God's judgment in your life. And so listen, if you are sitting here today or watching that you are you are still in your sin, if that's you as you've not turned to Jesus, you've not given him your whole heart and life, then that is where you are. You're in the bad news. You're going to receive judgment. You're going to be desolate. Which is why we as believers must be good news people where we are declaring there is a way out of your emptiness. There's a way out of this brokenness and it's found in Jesus. That's what we proclaim and declare and believe and sing. It's found in Jesus. But remember, someone cannot call on salvation unless they believe Jesus is the way. And they cannot believe unless they've heard that. And they cannot hear that unless someone tells them. You are sent, right? Like that's, that's the whole point of that. It's what beautiful, Jesus sees beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. That's you and me. We can be that. Now, let me be clear. It's up to God to save, right? It's not up to us. We're still reformed here. Like This is God's deal. He's saving. We're just vessels of his mercy. He calls us to do what Psalm 96 says, that as we go in our lives, we declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. We say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Like that's our task now, is to go declare who he is. And again, we don't know who he's gonna save. We don't know how many he's gonna save, but check this out. Micah 7 said that when God's kingdom comes, he will save some. He's going to save. Some will call on him. Some will come to his mountain. So that means for us, we can have confidence that as we go tell of God's salvation, as we do go and declare the gospel, some will believe. Even if we're terrible at sharing the gospel, God's still going to save, even those who appear to be opposed to it right now. The nations, Assyria, Babylon, some will come. It's just the way God works. He works through us. Plus there's this. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. In other words, this is part of the conclusion of the story. 
Because you know he didn't poof you out to heaven as soon as you believed, right? He left you here, and he left you here for a reason. And that reason is not merely to survive until he gets here or to hold up in in this cult-like building that you're gonna just get away from the world. That's not what he's called us to. He left you here to include you on his mission. He has graciously chosen you to use you as his global ambassador, which means you can pray, you can give, you can support and encourage others to go, you can go yourself, but you are an ambassador as that. Just like Abraham was blessed to be a blessing to others, you are saved to carry that same gospel to others. He's blessed you with the gospel to be a blessing to all nations. But hear me, you won't do that. I won't do that. Only if I'm transformed by what Jesus has done in my life will I see that as worth it. Will I, will I pay the cost needed to make that a reality in my life? Will I walk the hard road it's gonna take to carry the, gospel, carry the gospel to this people group? Only if I see him as worth it, if I desire more than anything else to see him as glorious to the ends of the earth, to see him as glorious to the ends of my street, only when I see him as that and I desire his worship to be going to the ends of the earth, that's the only reason I'll do it. Because that's what's coming on the day he returns, right? On that day, Micah 7, on that day, the nations will worship. The mountain will be raised up. God will be seen as glorious. That's what is coming. And so now we just get the privilege of playing a small part of seeing that kingdom come even in small forms today. That's what's coming one day, and so we get the opportunity. John Piper said it well, like missions exist because worship doesn't. There's places Jesus is not being worshiped, and so we carry the gospel to them in hopes that they will, prayerfully that they will. And so as you you prayerfully entrust your future to the Lord, Say, God, whatever you want, whatever your deal is, your plan, not mine, I entrust my future to you. As you do that, commit to carrying his gospel to your neighborhood, to the nations, to your family, for his glory, because he is worth it, church. He's worth it, not just in here when it's really easy to say, yes, glory to God, praise the Lord, and we're gonna sing here in a little while, and it's gonna be, yes, praise God. It's worth it even out there. He is worth it when it gets hard, when it gets tricky and people push back, he's worth it. 